Hello, this is Father Rich coming to you from a bookshelf in my sitting room that contains the next uh, masterpiece, number 37, that we're going to talk about today. And it's the novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky, a Russian novelist, uh, writer of the 1800s, and it's called The Brothers Karamazov. And it's uh, some, arguably considered by some the best novel ever written. At least that's what our author of the, the 75 Masterpieces says. Um, and it's kind of written off of a parallel from um, Dostoevsky's life. But um, it's written with three voices, three brothers that represent three kind of philosophical views uh, of life that were prominent in the uh, 19th century Russia and really throughout the world. And it comes after, um, again, uh, something that happened, uh, uh, an incident that happened in uh, Fyodor's life that he, uh, his dad was um, killed, his father was killed. And so in, this, in the novel, the, uh, the three brothers' father is killed and, that, and they, get, they represent the three voices trying to make, um, make sense of this uh, occurrence or not make sense of it. So the oldest brother's name is uh, Dimitri. He's a sensualist who mostly lives for pleasure. He's basically the philosophy of his dad had approached and that led to his demise. Um, and of course, these are the, um, the, this is the approach of life that just seeks to, to get the most out of life in this, in this world, out of pleasure, out of the physical. And, um, he's the one accused of killing his father. He doesn't seem to be able to control his physical urges. And so he's the oldest. Then there's Ivan, who is an intellectual and a skeptic, um, kind of this tense, kind of unhappy man that, um, He's, a, he's, he's in a state of mutiny against God, as they say. He's an atheist. Basically, uh, his conviction is rebelling against a God who really isn't there. It's against, the obviously, the faith of many of the people of Russia at the time. He sees the uh, horrible suffering in the world that, um, that basically says there, that a God cannot exist with this suffering that happens. The, the famous Grand Inquisitor chapter, which we had to read, I know, when I was in high school, um, or maybe it was college, was uh, as part of the novel. It's a story that Ivan tells as an attempt to expose faith as a, as a delusion. Um, and then the youngest brother, Aloysia, is a gentle spiritual man. So he, re he represents the religious, and, uh, and obviously Dostoevsky is presenting him as the best response. Um, his closest companions are the monks of the local monasteries. Uh, from his perspective, forgiveness and long-suffering love are the only hope for humanity. And that's ultimately the bottom line of the story that, that, the, uh, that gets uh, the message and the theme um, that gets portrayed by the, the author. Near the conclusion, uh, the writer reaffirms the reality of eternal life beyond this veil of tears. And so leaving the funeral of his deceased young friend, Aloysius is asked, can it be true what's taught us in religion that we shall all rise again from the dead and shall live and see each other again? And uh, Aloysius' simple answer certainly echoes one of Dostoevsky's own utterances. If you believe in Christ, then you believe you will live eternally. Um, so this was the faith of the author, and he ultimately presents this. Um, it's interesting because... The um, again, he grew up in a Russia that he was disillusioned by much suffering, much injustice. Um, and so he, um, Dostoevsky, early on writes a book in the midst of this in 1846. He was born in 1821, so he was only 25. It was called Poor Folk, and it was it, it received a very good response. But the uh, the themes that were in there led him to, to joining kind of a, a rebellious group of writers and journalists, not a dangerous group, but dangerous in the eyes of the government, the Russian government. And so they were eventually, he was rounded up with 20 others and they were sentenced to death. Um, kind of considered this, uh, you know, uh, against the government. And they were actually brought to the very point of about to being shot in front um, of a shooting firing squad. And then the czar uh, lifted the uh, the sentence at the last minute and sent them into years of hard labor at Siberia. He ended up being there for four years uh, in Siberia, then still remained in exile. I don't know where, but not in the work camp for six years. So 10 years 
And the only thing he could have a copy of was the Gospels. And again, these are those moments that make or break you. And Dostoevsky ended up um, clinging more fully to his faith and was able to kind of hold on to that faith in the midst of this amazingly. Um, he writes a book about some of his experiences called The House of the Dead and, um, you know, lived amidst just the very, you know, epitome of evil that he was having to deal with. So, uh, but he wrote in the midst of this, never, is there, never has there seethed in, in me such an abundant and healthy kind of spiritual life as now. Now my life will change. He kind of sees this moment in which he thought he was going to die, but then was given a second lease on life. It's kind of a rebirth, spiritual rebirth. And, um, and he dove into those gospels, you know, that gospel book that he was given in the prison. And in the midst of this, he would say, nothing is more beautiful, profound, sympathetic, reasonable, manly, and more perfect than Christ. If someone proved to me that Christ is outside the truth, then I would prefer to remain with Christ than with the truth. And so again, after the four years in prison, the 10 years, or six more years in exile, he would come out and start writing again. And one of the things he uh, was writing against, Nietzsche, his philosophy was becoming very prominent in Russia in the 19th century. And he espoused this uh, philosophy system, philosophical system called nihilism, um, which had taken root in many Russian intellectuals. So their assertion was that God did not exist and that the only real morality was that which would arise from superior thinkers who would not be tied to traditional moral standards, but rather could pursue a completely rational ethical system. So man be able to come to this ethical superiority uh, by the, the what, what Nietzsche would call the Superman. Uh, we studied this in, in our own philosophy, uh, philosophical studies uh, in, in seminary. But... Um, so that man could somehow come to this place of moral superiority by these, you know, superior human beings, these superior intellects. Um, and Dostoevsky couldn't embrace this. This was too much of an optimistic view about human nature, which he saw the, the evil of human nature or what it was capable of. Um, what he would say would be kind of this propensity of humanity to selfishness, self-delusion and violence. Um, so he would reject that. He would continue to write novels that would portray um, the religious and faith approach, the mercy, the forgiveness, and the sacrificial love that Christ is all about to be the answer to all of this. And so, um, yes, a, a, a voice of hope in the midst of a lot of um, negativity, depression, and despair in 19th century Russia. So the, the writer concludes the chapter with this quote from Father Zostima, who was a character in the Brothers Karamazov, which I would like to read to you. Brothers, be not afraid of men's sins. Love man even in his sins, for that already bears the semblance of divine love and is the highest love on earth. Love all God's creation, the whole of it, and every grain of sand. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. So that's the Brothers Karamazov from uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, 1879. Uh, next one we will cover is the, the Sagrada Familia Cathedral. It is a Catholic cathedral in Barcelona, one of two churches that are in here, or three churches essentially. So we look forward to doing that in our next one. Hope you'll join us. Thanks for joining us for this one. Have a great day and God bless.